All right, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us here this afternoon. I'm Laura Barber, and I'm the Director of Global Field Marketing and Publicity for AWS Elemental, an Amazon Web Services company. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with AWS Elemental, we were acquired by AWS about just over a year and a half ago. And we made our name in the video infrastructure space helping entities, mostly media and entertainment companies, deliver their content to any kind of device when and where consumers wanted that content. So chances are, if you're watching video in an app environment, you're probably watching uh, content that we have prepped for delivery. Today, we're combining our deep video expertise with the power of the AWS cloud. And that, uh, we use that to give video providers, such as broadcasters, pay TV operators, governmental agencies, and enterprise video operators, the ability to easily and economically deploy their workflows and scale those workflows so that they can stay focused on the creation and uh, distribution of compelling content that captivates their viewers. NASA is also a pioneer in the application of advanced media technology, including ultra-high definition 4K video. In late April of this year, NASA made a, if you will, pardon me, giant leap for live stream video when it delivered the first ever live 4K stream from space to Earth to viewers at the Las Vegas Convention Center on a huge screen during the National Association of Broadcasters show, and also to internet viewers globally on 4K UHD devices. The live feed from 250 miles above Earth was produced in collaboration with the US Space Agency, AWS, AWS Elemental, and Red Digital Cinema. In this afternoon's session, Dylan and Keith here will take you behind the scenes to learn more about the advanced imaging and cloud workflows that powered this unique milestone event, and then you'll also learn about how to apply these same workflows to accelerate your own video infrastructure and 4K video initiatives. First, you're going to hear a brief history of live video from space from Dylan Mathis. He is the communications manager for the International Space Station and is based at Johnson Space Center in Houston. He handles all internal and external communications for the ISS program and is a very articulate guide to governmental leaders, scientists, and the public through the complex universe of multidisciplinary scientific research that can only take place in the zero gravity environment afforded on the International Space Station. He also kicked off NASA's initial 4K efforts um, as the co-principal investigator for the Red Digital Cinema camera that was flown to the ISS in 2015 and now anchors the workflow that we're going to talk about today. Next, we're going to take a deep dive into 4K cloud-enabled workflows with Keith Wimes, who is Chief Marketing Officer for AWS Elemental. He's a veteran of the video, IPTV, and telco industries, and over the past 10 years, he's played a key role in helping usher in the era of software-defined video for multi-screen content delivery. Keith's work helps media enterprises globally as they pursue new revenue and service opportunities, such as over-the-top television or live 4K, plus cool new ways for viewers to watch the content they want when they want it, such as apps like Catch-Up TV. After Keith's presentation, I'll moderate a brief fireside chat with Dylan and with Keith. I encourage you to interrupt us frequently with any questions that you have. And with that, I'm going to get this uh, session underway um, as a segue. Uh, in talking with Dylan earlier today, he reminded me that one of the key objectives for the ISS program is to inspire others. And so now he's going to tell us a little bit about how NASA is doing that. Please well, join me in welcoming Dylan Mathis. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, quick question for you guys out there. How many people are in space right now? Anybody know? Six, okay. Anyone else? <laughs> All right, we got a comedian, we're good, okay. Six, right now we've got three people in space. We will, in, in the next several weeks, we'll have another three joining uh, the crew on the International Space Station where we'll have a, a total of six. We've had, this is the space station. It was built over about 11 years uh, in 2011, it was assembly complete when the shuttle retired. 
It travels around the globe 16 times a day at 17,500 miles an hour. It is about the size of a five to six bedroom house and it allows us to do science that we can't do anywhere else on Earth. So if you hear nothing else from the NASA guy today, remember that we've got six people in space and we're doing science that, that can only be done uh, out of this world. It's about the size of a football field, so that helps kind of put it in perspective. It's pretty big. We have uh, 15 countries that we are working with, including Russia, uh, 15 countries around the globe. These are all of the different control centers and launch facilities that take cargo and crew to the space station. Like I said, we're doing science that we can, can only do in microgravity. It's a very unique environment that allows us to see things that we don't see here necessarily on Earth. That's Kate Rubens who came back uh, late last year. She uh, is a molecular biologist on the, uh, as, uh, <clears throat> as an astronaut and uh, she just uh, finished her mission on the station. So I'm gonna switch gears. I just wanted to give my, hey, NASA's still in business and we've got space going on here and we, got, we will have six people in space. But I wanna talk about video and, and how it uh, relates to uh, inspiring the world and the imagery that NASA uh, creates. This is the first image taken by Alan Shepard when he went up hit his hand on the ceiling of the, of the atmosphere and came back down. Kind of a grainy film, analog image. But it was him saying, hey, look what we've done. This is what this looks like. Another mon monumentous occasion was, and you guys will recognize this. On this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man. Definitely not 4K. Um, but what you get from that is it's, it's NASA's way of saying, hey, we're here, we are, we're, we are staking our claim, so to speak, and, and, and trying to inspire the world that humankind went to the moon. We had to have evidence of that. We had to show that. We had to bring the public, not only the American public, but the world along with us. So, in trying to top that, we added color. It's kind of hard to see color on the moon because it's gray, right? But, hey, we saw the red sleeves, but we tried to one-up and, and, and start broadcasting from uh, the moon in color. Next one, we, another way we would do imagery is actually bringing film back. This is some 16 millimeter film shot with the infamous buggy, right? Gorgeous looking stuff, but it's not real time. And then fast forward to 2006. We partnered with NHK and Discovery Channel to do the first live high-definition downlink from the space station. It was the first live HD from space ever. And so while we've had all of this kind of ratty video since the early moon days through the shuttle program, we were able to actually do high-def from the space station. Uh, and this was a pretty significant feat. Uh, it took us two years, year and a half to two years to certify the hardware. Flying stuff in space is very, very, very challenging and difficult because you're in a confined area the entire time. And so things like off-gassing and flames, flames are not good in a contained environment, obviously. So we had to make sure that this thing was safe. But it took us almost two years and uh, over a million dollars to get this into space. Fast forward now to 2016. The geek per square inch right there is very high. We uh, teamed with Elemental to uh, do the first live 4K from space. 
and we'll, we'll talk more about the details of that in just a second, but the certification, we had this on what we call on dock and ready to go in 29 days. So we've gone for something that took us two years down to 29 days, and we are able to, without getting too technical, we had 6,000 pieces of information, six gigabits a second of data. And with this remarkable encoder, we were able to get it down to 18. So I've gone from 6,000 to 18. That's how I can get that down through a satellite and some fiber from the International Space Station going 17,500 miles an hour. When we were doing this, I felt kind of like Doc in Back to the Future when the lightning's coming, you know, and he's doing this. It had that kind of feel to it, but it all worked, and it worked very, very well. And so what I'd like to show you, if we can toggle projectors, I'm going to show you some excerpts from the actual 4K event that we did. And what you'll notice, um, you'll see some flashes in here. And these are flash frames. These are just edits. That has nothing to do with, with the live event itself. We just are condensing something into that was 11 minutes down to 2 minutes and 47 uh, seconds. So uh, let's take a look. Who's excited? First live 4K transmission from space ever. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Yes, we're ready for the event. <laughs> what is the ISS position in orbit right now? Well, we're just passing over Baja, California, and we're heading in an arc over North America. By the time we finish talking, we'll be over Central Africa. Wow. <laughs> Five miles Amazing. a second. Amazing. Now, of course, we're calling from the NAB show here in Las Vegas, where next generation broadcast and production technology comes to life. Are there any films about space that have truly inspired you? <laughs> well, for me, it was <clears throat> definitely the right stuff. As a, as a test pilot who you know, Edwards was my second home. You know the start where there, he's like flying through the clouds and he's talking about there's a demon that lives on the meter. And then the plane crashes, it explodes, it goes to color. That's just so awesome. And then also space balls because we're basically flying at ludicrous speed right now. <laughs> okay. What do live 4K and Ultra HD help you do on board the ISS in terms of scientific research that you couldn't do before? You know, 4K and, and ultra high def uh, actually make you feel like you're there. I mean, if you look really close, you can probably see into my pores right now. Granted, nobody wants to see there, <laughs> but everybody wants to see the Earth from this vantage point. And probably the biggest impact that these technologies will have is bringing everyone else on the planet to see these amazing sites that we get to see every day and inspire them to push beyond just living on earth and <laughs> we're gonna play ping pong oh. and a little food coloring added to that Peggy, Jack, I don't know if you can hear the oohs and ahs in the audience here, but it's tremendous. Congratulations on all your accomplishments, and we look forward to a lot of live 4K UHD from the space station for years to come. Thank you. So how did we do that? It looks pretty easy. I saw some, actually people are still smiling a little bit. Um, it looks really easy when we just play back a compressed, what was that, 20 minutes or so, 15 minutes yeah. of actual activity that we had going back and forth. Uh, we had a delay, so Sam would actually, Sam was doing, you can't really tell from the clip exactly, but we were, we were doing a live interview, right, with, with the astronauts on the space station, and so he would ask a question and then wait 11 seconds to get the answer. And, and that's challenging. And there's some technical details in there 
that we'll go through. But what I want to do is actually walk through the workflow. So that was the, in some ways, the end result. And I'll show some slides as well in terms of the user experience at the end. Uh, but I want to walk through basically from the space station on through all the way to a viewer's perspective. How do we, how do we pull this off? What were the different components? And you know, when we were at the show, um, we, we actually put it on the show floor as well. And there were about this many people at an event like upstairs gathered around a 4K TV. We're lucky enough to have this massive projector in here so that th that video was in uh, a form of compressed 4K. Uh, but the, the reaction from the crowd was very visceral. So you heard some clapping and oohs and ahs, and that was actually happening as well on the, on the show floor. This all starts up on the International Space Station that Dylan talked about. Um, you can see actually the red camera. Uh, with two astronauts that aren't actually there. Those are just space suits. You can tell they, they don't actually have arms uh, or hands coming out. They're just kind of, is that taped off? I'm not sure, but this is the storage area. But the camera, <laughs> the camera's in this area. And essentially, there are quad SDI outputs that come out of, of, of that camera, uh, uncompressed. And it goes into an encoder. And one of, the, one of the biggest challenges for us in participating in this is producing a, an encoder, and it's down here amongst the well-organized uh, technology on, on board the ISS. I probably shouldn't say that too, too harshly. But this is literally Velcroed into the ISS. Um, this is a, uh, about the size of a, back in the olden days, a, an encyclopedia, a couple encyclopedias stacked together. Our typical systems are anywhere from eight to 10 times this size. So we use full rack-mounted servers in a typical scenario. And we got it into a, a very small form factor uh, compression engine. So we take those feeds in, compress it in HEVC compression standard, uh, full 4K resolution, and then send that. Well, where do we send it? We send it over satellite, essentially, um, from the ISS. So you can see I've changed the ISS into this diagram here. We had a 4K feed coming down to the Johnson Space Center into Building 30. And you also see here an HD feed. And I think most people would assume that that was for some form of redundancy, maybe a, a backup in case the, the signal didn't work, because an HD feed might be 2 megabits per second, and the 4K feed was uh, right around 10. But it wasn't actually for that. It was to provide the audio, because it, we had a lack of compatibility, a little bit of an audio challenge uh, on board. And so the interface between the red camera and our uh, new encoder did not actually work. So we had a, an HD feed that had both video as well as audio, but we were using it literally for the audio. That then came down to building 30 at the Johnson Space Center. And essentially, we had two different, two different locations where we had redundant paths for this. And then we paired the audio back together again and then re-encoded before sending it out to the outside world. So the original, the original idea that we had in mind was essentially to transport this video just to the NAB show, just to the Las Vegas Convention Center, and play it out there. And we figured we can do that over Encompass is a service provider that does satellite uh, uplink and downlink services. We thought that that would work pretty well. Uh, but then we decided to take it to another level and add uh, viewers uh, basically all over the world. So this could allow anyone on Earth that happened to have either, well, they could watch it in HD, so we did HD resolutions. But if they had a 4K compatible, either a PC or um, a smart TV, they would be able to watch it. And so that upped the ante a lot, and we decided to do extra redundancy. So I mentioned the connection between the Johnson Space Center and Encompass to get it over satellite to the Las Vegas Convention Center. That's, that's dropped, and it's pulled down by a Roberts Communications truck. But for added redundancy, we added a dedicated fiber link to make sure that if this link happened to come down, that we would have a full signal into the uh, location there at the LVCC. You see this one other connection here. Anyone know what POTS is? Plano Television Service. How old is that technology? 120 <laughs> years old, more, 140 years old. It's really old. <laughs> Uh, this was used as the, the feed coming back from the convention center for the audio 
so that the folks in Johnson Space Center could hear what was going on. When Sam was asking a question, it was actually being dropped over the line via POTS, really basic technology over a phone line, and then back up to the ISS, and that created the, the round trip. It created the 11 second delay from when we were asking the questions to when we actually got the responses. In addition, we had a switcher. So just imagine there's a stage up here, a couple 4K cam cameras for redundancy and different shots, and then a, a switcher, a very high-end switcher that was capable of doing 4K switching. And all this was basically blended together into a production that would both play out on the screen in the, in the venue. So those that were in the venue got to see what you would see, what you just saw earlier that we compressed down. So they could see the whole interaction, they could see Sam asking the question, they could see him on the screen, and they could see the responses coming down around 10 seconds later. And in addition, we were taking that production, which incorporated a live event and the video that was coming down from the Space Center, and we re-encoded it yet again to deliver it to end users so that anyone with an internet connection that had a 4K capable, HEVC capable uh, playback could be able to see that. And that's another hard part of this, right? So this is where the cloud comes in. We didn't know, we had no idea. We knew that one video or two with the HD were gonna be coming down from the ISS to the uh, Johnson Space Center. We knew that we were gonna be encoding the live event there on the stage. We knew we were gonna be capturing uh, the questions as well as uh, the, the, the responses as those happened. But what we didn't know is how many people were gonna watch this. We knew there were gonna be venues within the uh, the show itself where we could watch it. We had it at our booth, as I mentioned. Uh, but essentially, it was going to go all over the world. And, and that's what it did. Now, 4K is, is still very early in the adoption, so we didn't expect millions of viewers. But we did get tens of thousands of simultaneous viewers for this event. And so we leveraged a AWS to have not only redundancy, but to get, be able to get everywhere. So we had complete dual redundant nodes in both the western region, uh, up in Oregon as well as in California. So we had dual uh, ingest uh, over Direct Connect. And then we had a Delta service, which is an origination service uh, to do the packaging of the content so that it can go to various players. So HLS is an Apple format that's very common in this case. And then we had a load balancing uh, capability that's provided by Amazon Elastic Load, balancing, load Balancer, as well as Route 53 for DNS and then CloudFront for CDN distribution, and then edge caches as well. So we were able to do this end-to-end -end not knowing how many simultaneous viewers we're gonna have. We were able to do it knowing that a typical HD feed is two megs. This is gonna be more than five times that, and we were able to scale it all over the world. The viewer experience. So from a viewer experience standpoint, anyone that wanted to was able to basically sign up and register for the live event. We published this on uh, awsliveevents.com. It's where you may see, if you're familiar with, uh, actually some of the sessions here, the keynotes are live streamed. Uh, Reinvent, the keynotes are live streamed. Same type of site. And we basically enabled that for 4K. Prior, it had never been done on the AWS site. When users, uh, viewers tuned in, they came to a slate initially. You know, they tuned in maybe five, 20 minutes before. They'll see a slate that it's about to start. And then they had that magical 4K experience, that inspirationalist experience that we were trying to really, the, the whole motivation behind doing this, and they were able to have that. And so when you put the whole workflow together, all the way from capturing on the ISS, a lot of innovation happening here, we basically built a new small form factor product line for that, getting it downlinked and using <laughs> using some trickery there where we, we stripped off the, the audio feed from the HD signal and blended it together with the 4K, and then having dual, uh, dual means of getting both over, over uh, satellite via the Roberts and, and Encompass uh, workflow as well as over a direct connection uh, to the convention center, and then out into the web so that the distribution can ha happen. Now in this case, you're not monetizing the content. This is for exposure for NASA. Um, but in many cases now, you'll start to see ads being added to content like this. And 4K very much is an internet delivered medium today, uh, with the exception of some new services that are coming out from uh, pay TV operators like DirecTV and whatnot. And then being able to see these on other devices. So there were single points of failure 
right? So the encoder was a single point of failure. Um, mostly based on, well, you can only have so much weight up there. Um, you know, we, we trusted that it would be reliable and that that would work. The downlink has some reliability, you know, redundancy to it. I would say it wasn't, wasn't foolproof given we were only sending one 4K signal down, but we could have fa fa failed over to the HD stream. But then end to end, everything was, was completely redundant. And so this is a, an interesting quote that came out from the show, some of the coverage. Someone local, actually, a local journal, journalist uh, said this in terms of, this is awesome, the closest to, the closest, closest the general population could get to something like this is at planetariums, which shows video with grainy quality. And this was just pristine, like the reaction. This has been, what you saw earlier has been compressed a number of times. Uh, but on the show floor, it was, was absolutely amazing. And then there, were, there was a tweet storm that happened. We pulled out a few of these. You know, best live stream ever. There's no mic drop in space, which I thought was hilarious. There was a point at which Peggy Whitson, uh, and we showed a little bit of it, but she basically passed the mic, drop, dropped it, and it you know, floated over. Um, and then this one, this is kind of hilarious. I won't read the whole thing, but you know, uh, that stream, was mind blowing. I finally got my money's worth of this damn curved TV. Um, so lots of lots of good <laughs> lots of good exposure, and that's that's really how we how we did it. And if you do desire, if you do want to see the full event, so the full event I think takes about thirty minutes, maybe forty minutes or so. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually up, up on uh, Amazon Video. So if you're a, a Prime subscriber, you can just go there, just search for 4K NASA, um, and this will come up, and you can. You can take a look at the end-to-end -end production that we did, which included not only the live Q&A, uh, but a panel session that talked a little bit about it. And we had other astronauts. Um, there were a lot of astronauts in this event, which was kind of cool. Um, two women astronauts. How many? Two women astronauts. Two women astronauts, one, with a, one a record holder uh, for the most days in orbit. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Of any US astronaut. Yeah, so if anyone wants to watch it, just feel free to go to that, and uh, if, you, if you enjoyed it, then give it a like. Thank you. OK. So thank you, Dylan and Keith. And we're now going to have a, a fireside chat. I often ponder why we call them fireside chats, because I don't see a fire. Maybe I take things too literally. It's, it's kind of red, so we'll pretend. If you have one on your phone, feel free to use it. Um, but before we start, I wanted to see if there's anybody in the audience who had a question before, uh, before we undertake our own Q&A up here. Any questions right now? OK, and don't hesitate to raise a hand. Holly is in the back with the mic. And she will be able to uh, run around. And I think we do have a question up here in the second row, actually, Holly. It's hard for us to see because of the lighting, so shout if we don't 40, see 40,000 lumen lighting is killing our retinas. How much latency was there, um, you know, for the users that were watching over the internet through AWS? How much extra latency was introduced going through AWS to the live stream? Do you mean yeah. go ahead? So, oh, I actually has a mic, so I don't have to repeat it. Um, so, from the point of the actual production facility to the end user, it's typical latency like you have with streaming. So, we were using uh, chunked streaming, which actually adds about anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds, depending on how many segments that your streams are. And so most of, the most of the latency is associated with that. And then there's the, the round trip, obviously, that I was talking about earlier with the, the interaction with the astronauts. But from the point of sending it out, it was about 10 to 15 seconds. Yes, right here in the middle. Oh, oh wait, oh, we have one next sorry. one, so we're gonna, we'll optimize it. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a question. With the uh, coming out of the encoder, uh, the uh, HEVC over UDP over uh, transport stream. Was that like a MPEG TS transport stream going out there? Yes. And uh, I, I guess from there it was all uh, like that 4K stream wasn't re-encoded. It was just uh, you know, just remuxed, I guess. No, it was it was encoding in real time. I, from the uh, from the hardware on the ISS, right? Correct. Okay. Yep. Good question. You were asking kind of, were we playing any tricks with the quality by pre-encoding it and taking time? Which can be done. Well, but. I, think, I think what you said was that it was, uh, the, uh, I know that you did have like a 1080p one that, that one would have been, uh, that was, that was 
Actually, that was a separate encode that was taking place on the space station as well. And then we were creating multiple renditions further down in the workflow from the 4K. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Jeff Barr announces something new with AWS every, every five minutes, right? So a lot of changes with AWS since you launched this. I'm, I'm curious, with the services that exist today, would you have done anything different? And if so, what, what other services might you have leveraged? Would you have architected any differently? You know, uh, you know Lambda and serverless, a lot of other, other new technology. Do you, do you have any answers for that? I do. No, that's really I your, don't want to your, take, I'll take your it. department, man. Yeah, I'll take it. So a lot of these, uh, a lot of what we showed in the workflows were uh, appliance models of encoders. And, you know, uh, when we were acquired by AWS, that was a big question in the industry in terms of we had customers that were using our capabilities in the cloud. We had those that were doing basically software in their own data centers, and then we had appliances that were a full bundle. And over time, uh, what's happening is a lot of the um, workflows that are kind of downstream are going into the cloud, but there are still a lot where appliances are needed, right? So obviously on the ISS, it's not a very, well, it's a cool example, but it's not generally applicable. But you do see that uh, at the capture locations of every arena uh, where you're capturing content. Um, any, any live event you have where you have an encoder, you're not going to send it un uncompressed uh, up into the cloud to then be re recompressed into multiple renditions. Um, we are seeing a lot of workflows that do have um, a lot of advantages from utilizing things like CloudFormation templates. And we have those for VOD processing and for live event workflows, and they're published on the AWS site. And so you start to incorporate the full breadth of services for monitoring and notifications and all of those services. And then over time, we'll see more and more capabilities that are, I would say, more media aware and more video aware uh, starting to migrate there. So yeah, it'll, it'll happen obviously over time. Thank you. Yep. All right, well, we'll kick off Dylan. Uh, first question is for you. Um, and that is about the role that compression efficiency plays um, in ongoing deep space research for NASA. And then also, can you help us understand how compression efficiency helps accelerate scientific discovery going forward, even looking toward Mars? Right, so, so for us, you know, we have a limited bandwidth of, of, of how much we can downlink from space station. We have a a 300 megabit pipe, which that sounds really big, but by the time you have telemetry data, surveillance type video that's uh, standard definition, science data, all of those things coming down, you use up that pipe pretty quickly. And for us, having an efficient compression, um, whether that's for video or for data in general, is going to be crucial for us to do anything with the moon and Mars, um, especially going to Mars because we will have very, very limited uh, data uh, bandwidth that we can send back, you know, a couple megabits kind of thing, depending on what, we're, what type of technology we end up going with. And so it is, it is crucial that we, we use this type of compression this I mean that is, is that's amazing to me that we can get something that's 6,000 big chunks of information down to 18 I, I don't know how that replicates itself and then comes back out on the other side and it looks just pristine like the way it was originally acquired so um, it is it is like I said it's crucial and we will want to take advantage especially of of uh, the new codec uh, HEV, what is it, HEVC uh, codec for all of our future camera upgrades that we will be doing on Space Station. And just a, a quick question, I'm going to stick with you for just a second, Dylan. Um, what's the bandwidth that you have on the ISS right now? So it's 300 megabits um, divided into 12 channels. And one, uh, a channel can go up to about 100 megabits. Um, there's different ways to, to multiplex it all together. Um, and that, that is, we're very fortunate that we have that kind of bandwidth. We won't have that when we're trying to send back video from 
the Martian surface or from the lunar surface. Okay. Keith, um, I want to switch over to form factor for just a second. And um, if you could just maybe outline very quickly um, some of the physical traits that we had to address or adapt uh, with the encoder that ended up on the ISS. Yeah, so when we were, when we were asked to do this, um, our, our, as I mentioned, our typical servers, if you're looking top down, are you know, too deep, uh, one RU uh, systems. And so to get it into a form factor that's basically a, about that large was a challenge. A lot of our systems um, actually incorporate multiple GPUs within them. Um, and so we had to work very, very hard. And importantly, the, you know, as Moore's law continues, the processing power is getting to the point where um, we can utilize smaller form factor solutions. Um, once, we, once we found a hardware package that would work, um, the team working with NASA had a, a lot to do in terms of mostly ensuring the safety of those that are on the ISS, right? They're taking basically a foreign entity um, onto the ISS, and we had to go through a 128-point checklist, uh, things like EMI, um, power dissipation, uh, there was, a, I guess, a point in the checklist where they're looking at different scenarios that can happen. Imagine this transistor happens to blow or this capacitor blows out the fan and the dust that happens to be in the fan gets in the eyes of the astronaut, then what? Um, and so going through that type of detail list was challenging, but we were able to do it. Uh, I think we did it in a pretty fast time frame uh, compared to similar circumstances, and in December we we were able to shoot, so we did this event in, uh, we didn't talk about this, I don't think, but we did this event in April, but the encoder left Earth in, in December. So it was shot up from a, a rocket launch that happened in Japan, and from there we started to, to test the rest of the workflow once it got up there. Okay. Dylan, <clears throat> obviously noted earlier this afternoon that NASA has achieved a number of remarkable firsts in terms of the application of motion, motion imaging technology, and I know that the cloud has played a key role in that, such as NASA JPL's um, uh, uh, streaming, live streaming actually, of imagery and video when Curiosity landed on uh, Mars in 2012. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how cloud, or how you see the role of cloud helping NASA deliver not necessarily more industry firsts, but um, advancing you know, the ongoing um, exploration of deep space and progression toward uh, possible life in other planets. Yeah. Well, you know, we, imagery, you know, when, when I ask people, what do you remember of Neil Armstrong, you know, they remember what, what we looked at earlier and the words that he said. Now, were any of us there? No. But that video told the story. And so, it's going, video will be a very crucial uh, tool to communicate to the world what's happening with the space program. Um, we can talk about it, we can do news reports about it, but actually seeing the moving image of something happening is, is critical. There are certain events and certain things that occur where you're gonna have huge, huge spikes and lots of interest. Curiosity is one of those where there were just, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people all over the globe, you know, clamoring to, to watch this live stream. Um, space Station is, is more of, um, it's kind of a, uh, a marathon rather than a sprint. A shuttle mission was a sprint. It was real quick, two weeks up and down. Space Station has been up there for 17 years. And so there's not a lot of these big wow events, but when they, when they are, we need that ability to ramp up quickly and to be able to, to stream to as many people as we possibly can. Okay. Keith, can you tell us, staying on cloud for just a second, um, a little bit more about 4K, live 4K transcoding in the cloud? Yeah, so live 4K transcoding um, in the cloud has, uh, up until recently, not actually been possible in real time. So you can do transcoding uh, fairly easily because you have time uh, to be able to take a file and, and do the algorithms that are required to do that. It's only been in the last few months that we've actually proven that ability. Um, to do this, and I, I think what will typically happen is that a contribution feed in 4K will come up into the cloud over like a direct connect uh, connection, and then transcoding will happen on the fly to create multiple renditions of content so that you can save the up, up, uplink bandwidth uh, 
to the cloud. So you can, instead of uploading everything that you need to distribute, you can do that one contribution and then create the renditions that are required, not only for different screen sizes, but within screen sizes when you're delivering video, uh, you have to accommodate different network bandwidth conditions for the viewers themselves. And so there's adaptive um, levels of content that are created there that are not only 4K, but they're, you know, the lower, lower end of that will traverse into the HD resolution and in some cases down to the SD resolution uh, over the course of time. So just one last question for you, Keith. Yeah. Um, the workflows you put up there were impressive. Um, I might not call them not complex. Um, but would you, how, would, how would you qualify this workflow in terms of how easily it would be for somebody to repeat it or to adapt it for their own use? Yeah, so I think the, I think the great majority of it is completely replicable, uh, particularly on the delivery side. So the delivery side of what I showed with the redundant, um, essentially redundant regions and then redundant origination um, and load balancing all the, w all the way down to uh, CDN distribution, that's built on common workflows that we use today. Um, and in the case of live, it's actually a workflow that we built for Amazon Video's live channels that they do. Um, and we have customers that are adopting that as well. I, you know, the contribution side, obviously if you, if you have a satellite, you're good to go. If you're Jeff Bezos or Elon uh, Musk, you have a, a chance of doing that. But you know, it's the same as if it was in an arena and then you do have to have that contribution link. Um, and we happen to do a lot of redundancy, so we did satellite and uh, a terrestrial, and that's just based on economics. How, you know, how much re resilience do you really want and how much can you afford? That's where it gets harder, but the rest of it is, is all available now. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, live 4K streaming, which gives us a much clearer picture and much more information about any given situation or environment, and we have the cloud that helps us scale. Um, I'm going to start with you, Dylan, but I'd like to get your response as well, Keith. What does this mean for full motion video? What's the implication? I think for, for NASA, it allows us to get our message out to a larger audience much more quickly. Um, the, the ability to have full motion video, whether it's video on demand or it's live streaming, um, we can reach people not just in the U.S., but we can reach people in other countries. Um, it's interesting to see the demographics because the International Space Station has 15 countries, all of the different interests from all the different countries that are not even in those 15 countries from around the world. Uh, it's fascinating. Keith? And I would say in the, in the public sector, and in particular in the federal market, I, I, kind, of, I kind of feel like this is a, a pivot point. So full motion video is almost a little bit of an antiquated term, I think. I, I think it harkens back to days when we were capturing um, you know, forward mission uh, types of work where we, couldn't, we didn't have the bandwidth to get all those streams back and so we would basically do reduced uh, motion, so only 10 or less frames per second. Uh, but this really proves if you can do it from the space station, you can do it from almost anywhere. And oh, that's interesting, we got, oh, that's, <laughs> you should probably just. Oh, screensaver. Ah, it's nice. It's a good distraction. Um, I think we're moving into ad advanced resolution video, right? And full motion is almost a given now. You either have 30 or 60 frames per second. Uh, rarely do you have less than that. Obviously, with film, you have 24. Um, but I think that's what this shows. It shows that, you know, sometimes terms like POTS, right, becomes antiquated. No one uses POTS as a phrase anymore. People don't use landline hardly anymore as a phrase, and, I, and I, think, I think that in some ways is the case with, with full motion video. Okay. Before our, our last question, I wanted to just turn it back to the audience again and see if there's anybody who has any follow-on questions for Keith or Dylan. Holly, could we? Thanks. Was that compression you were talking about, is that a Lucy compression algorithm, or is it looseless? Was it a new compression algorithm that we were using? Was it a lossless compression algorithm? Lossless. Lossless. Lossless, sorry. Oh, lossless. No, it wasn't lossless. So we were using just pure HEVC and then. So has the feed been live uh, any time after the, the Las Vegas event? And is there a plan to, if, if so, is there a plan to kind of 
operationalize that feed uh, for certain events in the future. i turn that over to you, Dylan. Well, ideally, it would be great if we could do a shot out the window like some of the, some of the 4K video we just had rolling here a few minutes ago. Um, it would be great to do a live stream all the time, um, but the, the bandwidth requirements for us, we, we can't have that much uh, dedicated to that. However, there is a payload that's going up that may allow us to, to start streaming 4K, and once we get that to the ground, it's critical of how we get that out. Um, but that's probably two years off at this point. Okay, Holly, I think we have, do we have another question over there? It's a couple and then over here. One so. over here, too. <laughs> Sorry. Is the codec available to the public yet for what you did? The smaller form factor one? Is that yes. what you're asking? Yes. Yeah, so we, we showed it actually at, at the show at NAB, and it is something that can be ordered. Um, one of the things that you had mentioned before was with um, the amount of bandwidth available um, and the bandwidth of the, the stream, the 4K stream. Um, looking a little further out, uh, you have, you know, of course, NASA looking to Mars. You have SpaceX looking to Mars. Um, you have other missions that are going out further. Um, and Miner saying that Deep Space Network, much more limited bandwidth right. um, for, for a lot of those types of missions. It, it, does that, since you're having to go so much further out and you've got less bandwidth to work with, does it actually become easier, kind of as you look to these further missions down the line, to try and deliver video content back, um, simply because you're just not going to have as much to work with? And is, is ISS, in a way, sort of Making it, making it more difficult where you have to solve harder problems as opposed to when you start getting further out. Right, so like you were saying, the further you get out, the, the less you have to deal with. And a lot of it is honestly gonna be store and forward, more file transfer type stuff. Um, but if we can get the compression down to a point where you know, we, can, we can use the uh, HEVC codec with high def and have a very small bandwidth so we can do some live things. The problem is, you know, there's latency from Mars, there's latency from the moon even as well. You know, the 11 seconds we were experiencing here is nothing compared to that. It's minutes uh, at that point. Any other questions? Okay, we have no minutes left. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you very much, Keith and Dylan. Thank you.